Who is God? To begin with, God is. His name, Yahweh, or Jehovah, means I am. Exodus three thirteen and 14. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What am I going to say? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Or in the King James, it says, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God just is, always was, always will be. His name describes his nature, his essence. His name is, I exist. So this is the first and most important thing we need to know about God. He exists. He is there. What is he like? In Genesis, we see several facts about God right away. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God is creator. He made all things. Number 2, verse 2, the spirit of God was the active force or the active agent in creation. Verse 26, God made man in his own image. He gave him dominion, power, and authority over earth. Verse 29, God provided all that man needed. Chapter 2 and verse 2, God rested. Now, there are some implications here about God rested, and that's a subject for another day. Verse 17 of chapter 2, God gave man power to choose right or wrong, life or death. So we have the power of choice. So let's look at who God is. Number one, God is merciful and just. Note, there is a balance between these two opposing concepts. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness provided that you continue in his kindness. His justice must be satisfied by the enforcement of his laws. But his mercy must find a way to save us from his just judgment. Secondly, God is relational. He desires relationship with us. Look at Adam in the Garden of Eden when God walked with him. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden because they were naked and they were ashamed. So this apparently was a pattern with them. They knew when they heard the sound that it was God walking in the Garden of Eden. So apparently they had this had happened before. And uh, they were accustomed to God coming down with them in the cool of the day and fellowshipping with them or spending time with them. Now this has implications uh, of the eventual redemption of man because the Bible tells us that our sins have separated between us and our God. Sin broke that fellowship that man had with God in the Garden of Eden. But uh, Jesus restores that fellowship, and we'll get to that later. Number three, God is faithful. The Bible is full of promises. Look at the promises God made to Abraham and to the saints of old. And so God is true and faithful. He always keeps his promises. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to the thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. So God never breaks a promise. He will do what he says he does. Number four, God is forgiving. Luke chapter 15 tells the story of the prodigal son. This is a young man who asked his father for in his inheritance in advance. And his father gave it to him, and he went out and wasted it. And when he came home in shame, 
His father was waiting and watching for his return. And instead of berating him and punishing him, the father celebrated his return because the son was more important than the rules that he broke. It is clear that Jesus came not to condemn us for our wrongs, but to save us from them. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let me clarify something about the word begotten, referring to the only begotten Son of God. This term is different than the Old Testament term begat, such as Abraham begat Cain and Abel, and Abel begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. That word indicates procreation. The word in the New Testament the only begotten son is a is a Greek term monogenes. It means the only one of its kind. Jesus was the only one of his kind because he was not brought through procreation. We don't want to get the idea that God had relations with a woman and produced a son. That's not the way it happened. God miraculously implanted a seed into Mary and Thus, Jesus was born. Now, when Jesus was born, here's what it means. Uh, later in the scriptures, it tells us that God was manifested in the flesh. God came to earth in the form of a man because he wanted to experience humanity. He wanted to experience what his creation was experiencing so he could relate personally with what man goes through. We are told in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And there was an ultimate purpose, which we will get to later. But the Gospel of John, chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That was Jesus, and he dwelt among men. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. This clearly points to Jesus. Number five, God is transcendent. God exists independent of and greater than all of his creation. God is self-existent. He needs nothing to maintain his existence. He is sovereign. God does as he pleases. Job chapter 23 and verse 13. But he is unique and who can turn him? what his soul desires that he does. Psalms 115, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Psalms 135, verse 6, for I know that the Lord is great and that our God is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand. God's will is the reason for all things. His will is all commanding and all pervasive. Ultimately, God's will will prevail. 
All of creation is subject to God. Now, that doesn't mean that we are puppets on a string. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are robots programmed to do whatever God says. We are programmed in our DNA to to serve God, to honor God, to obey God. And, you know, man is the only creature in existence that has the free will to not serve God, to not honor God. But ultimately, no matter what we do, God's will will prevail. God is imminent. Which means God is here with us. He reveals himself through his word, the Bible, through his creation, through his son, and through his works. So God is both out there and down here. He is both beyond his creation and in the midst of his creation. His sovereignty keeps him above us, but his love keeps him with us. Number seven, God is spirit. John chapter four, verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. He is not flesh and blood. He is not confined to places or things. God is spirit. That's why we can't see him, because he's spirit. Number eight, God is life and the source of life. Everything you see and everything you don't see is created by God. He is life. He is the meaning of life and the purpose of life. All of life comes from God. Man was created out of dust and God breathed life into his lungs and into his spirit. Nowhere else can you find life. It cannot be produced in a test tube, although men try. And if we do ever succeed in doing that, we will create a monster. Man searches for meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life and all kinds of things, but it is only found in God. Number nine, God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. He simply is. Where did he come from? The ultimate answer is he didn't come from anywhere. He just always was. Number 10, God is self-existent. He requires nothing and depends on nothing for his existence. All of life is dependent upon him. Number 11, God is infinite. There are no bounds or limits to his divine nature. He is over everything. Number 12, God is one. There is no other besides him. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Ours is a monotheistic faith, born originally into a culture that was polytheistic. So we are firm in our belief that there is only one God and that God is only one. I believe that the Bible teaches us, though, that God is one God, but three persons in essence. God is a trinity. That is not to say that God is three different people but that his essence is tripartite, consisting of three parts, not separate, but one, indivisible. God is one in essence, but with distinct differences in essential elements of personality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Trinity is difficult to explain because our finite minds cannot conceive of it. It is impossible for us to understand. God is one being with three persons. Now, person is not the same as being. Your being is the quality that makes you what you are. But your person is the quality that makes you who you are. God is one being, Yahweh, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is more than able to exist like that because he is God. If we say God must have only one person like humans, then we are making God in our own image. And who are we to limit God? The Father is God, John chapter 6, verse 27. Jesus is God, John chapter 20, verse 28. And the Spirit is God, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 5. Three distinct persons with distinct roles. Jesus said it. 
In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why would he say that unless he was referring to three distinct persons of one God? In uh, John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, a helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and in you. So here is the spirit, also God. So there are three distinct roles, but one person. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If we look closely at the word we translate God, Elohim, we see that Elohim is plural. Let me give you an illustration from nature itself. The atom is the smallest particle in our makeup. And yet the atom is made up of three particles. Neutrons, protons, and electrons. All three make up one atom. Take away any part and the atom ceases to exist. You take out the proton, the atom is no longer there. Neutron, electron, any part, the atom is no longer there. It ceases to exist because each part, three parts, each part is interdependent upon the other part, upon each other. One cannot exist without the other. Any scientific mind will verify that there is just one atom, though it is made up of three parts. It's number 13, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. His presence fills the universe. God is not located in any one place at any time. This also helps me explain um, some things about the Trinity. Um, I've been asked before, what? well, if God came down to earth as Jesus, who was up in heaven running creation? Well, I believe that God can exist in two places at one time or in many places at one time. So God has no difficulty being here on earth as a man and yet being up in heaven running the universe at the same exact time. Number 14, God is omniscient. He is all-knowing, all-aware, all-understanding and insightful. God knows and sees everything. He knows past, present, and future. God is not limited to time. He is not confined to time because he is outside of time. God can see the beginning and the end at the same time, and all the middle, all the in-between. That's how God knows exactly what will happen. It's not that God uh, created us as robots or puppets and pulls our strings and makes us do everything we do, but that God sees what's going to happen, and so he knows everything. Even when we disobey, even when we go off in our own way and and pursue our own will, God still is in control because uh, Jeremiah gives us a good picture of this. Uh, Jeremiah tells us about a potter in his house and he's making a, a clay vessel and somehow the wheel jogs a little bit and, and the the uh, vase or the, the jar is marred. And so, and so the potter just makes that into a different pot. And st instead of throwing away the clay, he just makes it into a different kind of pot. God can do that. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is unlimited in his power. God is free to use his power to perform his will. But his actions are always consistent with his will and his character. Number 16, God is immutable. That means he never changes. His essence, his quality, his purpose, it never changes. Now, next time we will look at um, God's character and see 
a little bit more about what God is like. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless you.